All right, it's Friday. Let's get this done. Welcome to a Rubius survival guide to Elixir and Phoenix. Today we are going to be looking at the Elixir language and the Phoenix framework, and especially kind of comparing and contrasting how they differ from Ruby and Rails. If you are a Ruby developer or have some Ruby experience, then that's excellent. You'll get the most out of this. But if you don't have any Ruby experience, you could probably still get quite a bit out too, especially if you've used anything like Python or something kind of similar. With no further ado, let's get into it. What is Elixir? If you've watched many of my videos, you know, I generally like to go over some history briefly because personally it helps me understand things better, uh, especially understanding why certain decisions were made, which in an engineering context is often very important. So uh, let's briefly talk about the history of Elixir. Elixir was created by Jose Valim. He was a Rails core team member from early 2010 to mid 2014. He once received the Ruby Hero Award. Elixir was born as a language very similar to Ruby that runs on the Erlang VM. Now, why the Erlang VM, you may ask? That's a very good question. Well, the Erlang VM, first of all, it's, it's very mature, very stable. It's been around for a long time. It's been used in production for highly distributed programs, which as more and more of our programming goes to the web, we start to suffer a lot of the problems that distributed computing have solved. And Erlang is a solid, especially the Erlang Beam VM, is a solid implementation. It is based on the actor model, which we won't go into deeply, but just suffice to know that the actor model makes it very easy to parallelize your code, which is phenomenal. If you've ever worked with a web application that could be getting requests at any time and needs to service those and also interact. Elixir is a more opinionated functional programming language than Ruby is. As you'll see, there are pros and cons of that, of course. I love Ruby. This is not a why Elixir is better than Ruby. I still use Ruby all the time. I typically tend to use Elixir for my applications and Ruby for my scripts. With Elixir code, I've really noticed that the code tends to be a lot more consistent and not just my own code, but code that I read from others as well. And that code also tends to be much easier to reason about. Now, you've probably heard that expression thrown around before, and whether it means anything or to you not, I'll show some examples so you can kind of see what I mean. I want to address a big question that comes up a lot in conversation, particularly when you explain how Elixir was born out of Ruby. Why do we need a new Ruby? And why would we need a new Rails? Well, let's, uh, let's address that right up front. Uh, firstly, there's nothing wrong with Ruby and Rails. It's continually improving. Those, they're both terrific languages and terrific frameworks, and, and I would absolutely use them today. You know, personally, I, I, tend, I would tend to start new projects with Elixir and Phoenix, but I wouldn't fault anyone for choosing to go with Ruby and Rails. There are a couple of things about Ruby, though, that are suboptimal. And so I, I do want to kind of point those out as reasons why we might would care about Elixir. Scaling has always been something that's pretty costly with Ruby. Now, over the last couple of years, especially with Ruby 3, performance has gotten a lot better. So it is much better than it used to be, but it still is fairly big and slow, particularly when compared to other languages and other, other platforms. With Ruby and Rails, you can scale horizontally, typically, you know, as long as you don't paint yourself into a corner with your code. So the upper limit on scaling is not typically a problem. You can scale as high as you need to. Really, it comes down to cost. How much do you pay? How many app servers, how many instances do you have running? Sometimes the cost can get very high. I worked on a big Ruby and Rails app that had hundreds, I think possibly thousands of app servers that were running. Another thing that you tend to run into with Ruby at times is sometimes you end up choosing between two options with downsize. Regarding scaling and uh, multi-processing and threading, you know, we know that Elixir, one of its nice benefits is the actor model on the Beam VM, which makes parallelizing very easy. So why is parallelizing difficult in Ruby? Well, you when you wanna have more than one process or more than one thread running at once, you typically have 
two options, and they both have downsides. The first one, multi-threading. Threads are very light, and they can be very easy to use in simple situations. But as you gain more complexity, and especially when you start having threads that need to communicate to each other with other threads or operate in a shared memory space, then you can end up with deadlocks and race conditions. And uh, not only that, but a lot of gems are not thread safe. And so a lot of your dependencies that you may be using may break in subtle ways and you may not even know for a little while until something disastrous happens and your database gets corrupted or something. <laughs> That's a big concern. So Ruby does have a gil, a global interpreter lock, and that tends to make it so that a lot of operations are limited to a single run at a time. The other option that you will often look at and most commonly use in my experience is multiple processes. So this is essentially where you have you know, two separate app servers and each one is running Ruby. And uh, oftentimes you want to run one process per core that you have. That way you can keep, keep them all busy. There are some big downsides to that as well, uh, such as duplicated memory, high overhead. So by duplicated memory, that means when you have certain objects that are in memory that you're operating on, you may you will have multiple copies of those because each process will have its own memory space. That also tends to be kind of high overhead. And when you need to communicate between processes, you need to use some sort of communication mechanism for that. There are a ton of different approaches to IPC, inter-process communication, but uh, none of them are as good, in my opinion, as what Elixir offers us with the actor model. There's also some really cool and interesting tech that's emerging around WebSockets. Now, Rails is catching up on this uh, over the last bit, but uh, when I first put this together, LiveView was, was very new. And LiveView was, in my opinion, quite a revolutionary approach to how we do web applications. And we'll, we'll get into a little bit of details there, but this isn't really a LiveView talk, but I'll, I'll mention it for sure. But there's some, there's some really cool stuff that's, that's sort of emerging. Also, functional programming is gaining in popularity. And in my opinion, for a good reason, I'll go into some of those, but uh, functional programming is getting more popular and El Elixir has better support. It's, it's much more functional style programming language. So uh, that can be a good reason to, to use it. Let's talk about some of the benefits of Elixir. So as I mentioned, it's very performant. You would be amazed at how fast Elixir and Erlang code can run. And not just multi-threading, although that's where it really shines, uh, but it's it's quite fast. And particularly frameworks like Phoenix have been, have been built to really take advantage of different performance things. And so they can go real fast. And I mean, it, it's not unusual for my Phoenix apps response times to be under a millisecond, sub millisecond response times. That's incredible. If you have a highly CPU bound process, then there are faster options out there besides Elixir. But the vast majority of our applications are IO bound anyway, waiting on either network or database. So you get the speed and benefits that you get with Elixir are huge. Uh, as I mentioned, Elixir is highly scalable and that model is built into the language thanks to the Beam VM. It's the actor model. Essentially, each process is very lightweight. It's divided up into actors and each actor has kind of a channel. So if you ever use like Golang, then it's kind of a familiar concept and things that need to communicate between processes will go through these channels and it, it acts as kind of a, a central way to communicate. And what's really, really neat is the language, the VM has built-in clustering support. So you get the benefits as though your code were running on the same machine, even though it may be on different machines that are horizontal clusters. It can still use the same mechanism to communicate. And that's very powerful and comes in really nice. In my opinion, uh, this is obviously highly subjective, but I think Elixir is a cleaner language. It learned a lot from Ruby and uh, same with Phoenix and Rails. And as much as I do enjoy Ruby and Rails, there 
is a lot of magic that happens in, in Rails. And for that reason, I tend to not enjoy working in a lot of Rails code bases. You can write beautiful, clean, elegant Ruby code, but the language itself doesn't really help you too much with that. There's a lot of different ways to do things and a lot of different styles out there. And the Elixir approach really makes it a lot more consistent. Uh, again, I mentioned there's amazing tech possibilities like LiveView. Uh, to get an idea of the performance of LiveView, and this is actually a, a couple years old, but uh, there was a demo put together rendering 60 frames per second. That's 60 frames per second rendered on the server, sent over web sockets to the browser, and then rendered at 60 frames per second. It is absolutely possible to replace your client-side JavaScript framework with this. There, there are still some situations where I would still choose something like React, but they are far, far fewer. And largely the situation where I would still choose something like React would be in a progressive web app or something that needed to have offline functionality. As you can imagine, in an app that needs to be able to do stuff offline, server's not available, then it's not gonna be able to render things and send them to you. So for that reason, uh, Phoenix Live View is not a great choice. But other than that, it is. The, uh, the real sweet spot that I have found personally is with Live View and a very lightweight JavaScript framework like Alpine. So if, if you're uh, interested, look up the pedal stack. But using something like Alpine, it plugs in really nicely into Live View and they play really well together. And you can basically use JavaScript and the Alpine features to get all that client-side behavior you need, like opening dialogues, things like that. It's, in my opinion, it's very silly. I mean, you know, people do it and there's demos out there with people showing the display dialogue <laughs> with live view. I think that's kind of silly. Things that can be done client-side should be done client-side, in my opinion. The, the, server, the server side, the live view action should mainly be about data that's changed or anything that needs to go back to the server. But the vast majority of our apps don't really do anything client side besides just those menus and, and things like that. So that's, that's why I think live view is such a great model. And uh, anyway, let's move on. This is a terrible GIF copy of uh, the live view demo that uh, was done. So as you can see, this was 2018. This was several years ago that uh, they were able to do these animations at 60 frames per second on the server. So it's, uh, it's pretty incredible. All right, let's start getting into some of the details here and stop talking so theoretically. A huge thing with functional programming is immutability. There have been a number of attempts at moving this direction over the years and none of them have really caught on. And to kind of give you an example of how this matters, let's look at uh, some of this Ruby code on there. So you can see on the left here, we've just got a basic IRB prompt and we're creating a we're creating an array called cust ages, just a few numbers in it. And then we can invoke methods on that array. So like dot reverse, and we can examine the array and we'll see the dot reverse method did not change the underlying data. So the, the underlying array did not change. So uh, we could chain these, we can safely pass this around, it's, it's no big deal. But let's call a different, let's call another method on the same object, dot push. So here, let's try to, let's push a 26 to the end of our array. And then we can examine the return value and we can see that the original changed values. If you do not understand which type of behavior every method you call does, you are at risk of having unexpected mutations. And this can cause a lot of bugs. Some of the worst bugs I've ever had to fix were because somewhere deep in a 15 to 20 deep call stack, some function, some method was unexpectedly mutating the caller. And so you get into this defensive loop where you have to make all these copies and duplications in order to, you know, defensive programming style. And that can add a lot of bloat and overhead, and it's just it's just not pleasant. And this is something that Elixir totally fixes for us. It's not something we have to worry about anymore. 
let's talk about what actually is functional programming. So we throw this term around quite a bit, and we know that Elixir is a functional programming language. But what does that mean? You know, what, how is a functional language different than what we're used to, like object-oriented, for example? These are high-level things, and these are not global rules. There, there really isn't much in the form of must-haves for functional languages. It's more of an approach, more of a style. And there are some languages that are considered more functional, like Haskell was probably the winner there. But plenty of languages that aren't considered functional, like Ruby, have functional programming features in them. So it's not as simple as saying, this language is functional, this language is not, that sort of thing. But a functional language will have a set of features that you can more or less expect. The basic functional programming philosophy is to treat computation as the evaluation of functions. So if you think back to math class, anytime some sort of value changes or there's some sort of computation, there's a function involved. It's kind of a similar approach here. We're going to think about our functions as a transformation, some sort of transformation from state A to state B. With functional programming, you avoid mutable data and changing state. You will see in a lot of functional approaches, you'll see oftentimes like a single big state object that gets passed around. So that, that's kind of a, somewhat how Phoenix does things. But rather than pass in, say, big data structures to a function and having the function change that underlying data structure, you will work on copies. Now these copies are fairly performant because under the hood, they're not actually being duplicated unless they need to change. So kind of a copy on write approach. Functional programming is often declarative, which more or less means that programming is done with expressions or declarations, less so of statements. A good way that I heard it put was functional programming is what to do instead of how. Ruby already has a number of great features like this, and a lot of the libraries and conventions already do it this way. For example, when we iterate through an array with the dot each method, we're not telling the compiler or the machine exactly how to go through the loop. You know, we're not saying, you know, set a variable i equal to zero, now finish the loop and iterate it and run it again and do this check. In some languages, that's exactly how we would do it. But that's really more of a how to do a loop. And the language doesn't really need to know how to do a loop. It should already know how to do that. So by using the dot each approach, we're more or less saying what to do instead. We're just saying, go through a loop. And this approach can be extended to many different things, many different approaches. And this can be very, very powerful because it makes your code very readable and understandable. You can look at high level functions and really see an algorithm emerge. And without having to look at the details of all the functions that it's calling, you can see, oh, okay, we're gonna do this. We're gonna take the user input, then we're gonna apply it this way and we're gonna save it to the database. And then we're gonna return a confirmation, that sort of thing. And your code becomes much, much easier to reason about particularly when you combine that with some of the other features like immutability. Functional programming also really likes idempotent functions. You may hear, hear them called pure functions. They're essentially functions that don't vary based on their input. They're essentially functions that will always return the same output given the same input. So obviously, if the function is mutating or changing the input argument, then it can't do this. There's state involved. You might call the same function with the same values multiple times and get completely different results. When the compiler knows that functions are pure or idempotent, there are a ton of optimizations that it can do that in some cases can improve performance by orders of magnitude. So this is, this is really great for both performance, but also as a user, when you see a function invoked with some value, you don't need to think what other state exists possibly thousands of files away that I don't know about and that I can't read in this file. What, poss you know, what state could exist that's going to make this function behave differently? It allows you to get that whole context kind of in your head. 
just looking at the function definition because you know it's not changing anything outside of the function. So what you see is everything you need to understand it. The improvement in ability to reason about code is hard to overstate. With functional programming, we are also attempting to eliminate side effects. So this goes kind of hand in hand with the item potency. We don't want our functions making side effects because if they do, then that makes it dip more difficult to reason about. Let's do some compare and contrast here. Most people are familiar with object-oriented programming, so let's do some comparisons of how functional maybe differs from object-oriented programming. But I do want to note right up top here, these are not mutually exclusive. You can have a very functional approach using objects and vice versa. With OOP, we often think in terms of classes, objects, and instances. When I was doing my computer science degree back in the day, we were taught to model real world objects. OOP tends to think of state as instance data. You may be familiar with terms like instance variables and that state is often encapsulated, which is, is good, but that makes it so that many of the functions are not going to be idempotent. They will vary based on their input, based on internal state that may not be visible to the caller. So it makes it a lot more difficult to reason about there. With OOP, you focus on calling methods to get behavior on objects. So when you want to may do some computation, change some value, you will have some sort of instance, some sort of method handle, and you will invoke the method on that object and it will do its work. With the functional approach, we think in terms of data transformation instead. When you think about so many of the real world problems that we solve, even sometimes very large problems like returning a web page, we're not really dealing with objects. You know, the object model can be applied, you can model it that way, but we're really more thinking about data transformation. You know, a web request comes in, it's got some sort of data that comes in, a request path, some headers, that sort of thing, and it wants a response back. So we want to transform that request into some response. When you think of these problems in terms of data transformation, a lot of stuff gets so much simpler and you don't end up trying to kind of cram models in complexity to just do simple things. With functional approach, the state is minimized and isolated. So rather than having classes that may have this private state that's encapsulated and potentially could cause behavior that you're not expecting, the state is minimized and isolated. So the state will exist outside of what you're calling and the high level program that's operating can keep track of this and it can kind of keep it all in one place. And that is nice because you won't be sadly surprised by having your state suddenly mutated by something you weren't expecting to. Functional thinks more in terms of calling functions and passing in all the data as arguments. So with the object oriented approach, you've got some handle, some instance, and you invoke a method on that. There's all kinds of internal data that can be used by that function or method to get its work done. But with functional, any piece of data that that function needs to operate should be passed in. So you'll see it explicitly there. And when you're reading the code and trying to understand what some particular function does, it'll be immediately clear where all the data is coming from. As you can imagine, this makes testing way, way simpler. Tests in Elixir are so much easier to do, in my opinion. In the functional approach, you think the functions are essentially data transformers. One handy way to think about it is in terms of pipes. You probably already do this with whatever Unix type shell you enjoy, like bash, for example. It's a very natural way to express things. And with these tools that we use in bash, they are great examples of functional tools uh, in many cases where they, they run as separate processes. They don't share anything. There's no shared memory. There's no pre-existing state. You know, I mean, some tools may have config files or something that they use, but but generally speaking, when you invoke these tools, everything that they are using to get their work done is come 
in as either an argument or on standard in. If you invoke the same command with the same data, you're usually going to get the same result. Here's a example that I put in there, basically from our CI CD script with, uh, with GitLab, we had a need to extract the merge request ID. This, this is several years old, so I don't know, GitLab may do this already now, so it may be magically present in some variable, but at the time they didn't. So uh, I threw this together, which essentially just uses grep and awk and said to parse and extract the merge request ID from the git data that's present there. Each one of these invocations, as you can see, we're inv invoking the same function like grep or said, it's the exact same function, but it does different things depending on what data is passed into it. You can always know what's being passed in by looking at the arguments and also understanding how it operates on standard in. This is a very functional approach where we can reuse the same functions over and over in different ways. And you will see an emphasis on that as well in functional programming, have nice, neat little functions that can be reused, oftentimes in ways that the original author didn't even expect. But by writing your functions in a functional style, you can make them very useful. You are already doing functional programming type things in Ruby. You may not realize it quite yet, but uh, let's look at our friends like map, sort, select, and each. So if you're, if you're working on arrays or lists, that sort of thing, you already kind of do some of this stuff that's, uh, that's very functional. If you are new to this functional approach, it will take time to start thinking this way. It won't happen overnight. Something that really helped me and that I recommend to new people who are learning functional programming approaches is just start integrating some of the techniques right now. You know, don't, don't feel like you have to do it all at once. You don't have to flip a switch and now I'm doing functional programming. Just start using some of those techniques like try to avoid mutating any data, try to avoid side effects and global state and use modules instead of classes and focus on transforming your input data rather than how you would model it with objects. State, state, state. You know, we say that so often, but uh, think heavily about what state exists. Where is the state in your program? How is it being accessed? What is it doing? That sort of thing. And when you keep that in mind and you try to minimize, then you'll start to notice certain patterns just naturally emerge. One piece of advice though, if you're working with other people, if you have, like if you're working in a big Rails app, then keep it to Ruby. You know, don't, uh, don't start using crazy styles that nobody expects because uh, that may be functional, but it will make your coworkers miserable. So um, you know, keep it reasonable. But if you're doing your own stuff, go nuts. OOP versus functional. Which one is better? <laughs> this is a trick question. I would say it depends. Uh, I'm, I'm not a functional programming purist. I obviously do like functional approach and I evangelize for it, but uh, it's not necessarily better than OOP. Some applications work really well with a functional approach and others are pretty good for object-oriented programming. At the end of the day, it's, it's mainly opinions. You know, some people like things, other, other people don't. Just keep your mind open and try to stay with the rational arguments. Let's talk about some of the basic types. So when starting, when looking into a new language, I find it very helpful to have a quick overview of what sort of types there are. Luckily, because of Elixir's Ruby heritage, a lot of the types are the same or very similar to what Ruby has. You've got your integers. You can see a handful of examples there on the left. You can write them in binary and octal and hex. You've got floats. Floats can be written in a couple different ways. The very familiar, you know, 12.0. You can also use the scientific notation for your float literals. There are ranges, as you can see, and those are the same as what's in Ruby. Elixir has a type called an atom, which is basically just like Ruby symbols. You know, there are some small differences, but for the most part, you don't even really need to think about them. When I, when I read it, I don't think, oh, that's an atom. You know, I just, just kind of use it. And same with Ruby symbols. There are some examples on the right of some literals 
So you can kind of see, oh, by the way, IEX, we're going to cover this more in a minute, but IEX is the equivalent of IRB in Elixir world. So this is just a, a REPL with Elixir interpreting. One slight difference is with regular expressions. So these are still PCRE type expressions, but in Elixir, they're a little bit differently. You can write them in a very similar approach, but Elixir has a feature called sigils, which regular expression literals fall under. And they can do a lot more than just regular expressions, but that is one thing that they do. You can also use the modules that are available to operate on them. So you can see there on, uh, on that line 23, we define a literal regular expression. And then uh, we do an operation then on the next line where we, we invoke regex.split and we split the input string based on the regular expression and where it matches. So there's a ton of stuff you can do here. This is just an example of uh, working with regular expressions, but you can see that there are literals and then there are also modules and, func and functions available, much like in Ruby. Let's talk about strings. What is programming without the string type, right? Strings in Elixir are a little bit different than they are in Ruby, but most of the time you can think about them the same way. In Elixir, they are UTF-8, and they do support all the normal escape sequences that you're used to, like backslash n, backslash t, etc. In Ruby, the, there are single and double quoted strings, but they're basically the same. The only thing different is whether the values inside get interpolated. In Elixir though, they are actually different types. There are single quoted strings and double quoted strings. For the vast majority of your use cases, you're gonna just use the double quoted strings. The single quoted strings are actually character lists behind the scenes, whereas the double quotes are actually binaries behind the scenes. I think we'll get into that a little bit more here, but um, just, uh, just, just remember most of the time in Elixir, you're gonna wanna go with the double quotes. As I mentioned, single quoted strings are characterless under the hood. That means that all the list and enum functions will work, which is very nice if you want to use them in a way on strings, but they, because of their distributed nature, they are a lot less efficient to work with than what a binary string, a normal UTF-8 binary string would be. And to understand that, think about what it's like to work with linked lists instead of arrays. Linked lists can be great for different applications, but an array is always gonna be a lot more efficient to work with, particularly if you're able to just iterate them directly. So that's why you would mostly want to use double quoted strings, but you will see on occasion these single quoted strings. So it's good to understand what they are. As mentioned, double quoted strings are actually a binary type under the hood. Uh, meaning that they are sequences of Unicode bytes internally. So these would be more like what you would traditionally expect an array to be, like in C or Java. Because these are not lists, you do need to use the string specific functions to operate on them. You can't use all the, the list and enum functions. But in standard practice, I don't think I've actually come up with a, a time when that was a big deal. There's a lot of string functions in the library. And uh, as I mentioned, you're usually going to want to just use, you're going to want to use double quoted strings most of the time. Here are some examples. Something important to remember is that these are not objects. In Elixir, we're not dereferencing an object and invoking a method on it. String is the name of the module and which is more or less just kind of a namespace and then the function and then dot and then the function name. So we're always passing in the string as arguments. We can look at the first example here, string dot at, so string module and it's the at function. And you may notice that these all follow a similar convention. So we may not be dereferencing a string object, but it is always going to be the first argument. And that's important for uh, what we'll get into later with pipelines and whatnot. But the, the nice thing here is that you don't need to be aware of any existing state in the string. You can see exactly what's coming in and you can very easily follow the chain. So you can see that this mostly behaves like we would expect it to. Let's talk about lists. Sometimes better thought of like arrays. 
So here are some examples of list operations in Elixir. This is somewhat similar to our previous example in Ruby that we looked at where the array was modified by one of the methods that we called. Uh, but we just, we start out on uh, with 13, we create a literal list of ages, 21, 18, 24, and then we can invoke methods on them from different modules. The enum module contains a list of utility functions that work on enumerable types. So lists would be one. You can also do this with maps, which are hat like hashes and a number of other objects. So methods or functions that would apply to a general enumerable data structure or type will often be in this enum module. So like enum.reverse, we pass in the ages. Enum.sort, we pass in the ages and you can see it, it pretty much does what you expect. There is a list module which contains functions that are more specific to lists. So like dot pop at, that's not something that we would really do to some other type of object that's not, that doesn't behave like a list. But uh, there are plenty of things there. So we've got dot pop at, dot replace at, which more or less do what you expect them to do. This is kind of a new type called a tuple. So this is not something that really has an analog in Ruby, but a tuple, you can think of a tuple basically as like a list, but uh, it's fixed size. So tuples are used all the time, mainly as return values because they're very easy to use with pattern matching, which we'll cover in a minute. But you wouldn't really use a tuple to hold any sort of arbitrarily sized data. You're not gonna have a tuple really with data that came from the client or the user. These are, these are more for literals and for organizing, but they're pretty easy to work with. The only regret is uh, they use the same syntax that the Ruby uses for hashes, which is unfortunate, but uh, you can see here, we can define a customer literal and these tuples can have a number of different data types inside of them. And that all works perfectly fine. You can see here, we're doing some, some literal stuff. Uh, this example on two is actually an example of pattern matching, which if you don't understand that yet, don't worry, we're gonna go into it more detail, but it shows you how to easily extract data from a tuple. So if we have this tuple and it's got you know, a name, an age, a title in it, and we wanna get those values out, say we care about the name as a string or the age as an integer, then it's very easy to extract those in Elixir. The map type. So this is essentially what the Ruby hash type is. And more or less, the only real difference is a percent sign. So it's, it's gonna be percent curly brace. And that means we're dealing with a map literal. This took me a little getting used to, but once I did, it didn't bother me anymore. The syntax is a lot what you would expect from Ruby. In fact, if we randomized some of the, the names here, it might be difficult to actually know whether this was Ruby or Elixir code. So it um, map has a corresponding module that offers the utility functions just like list and enum do. So like map dot has key. And again, notice we're not using the map object to dereference and invoke some method. Where in Ruby, for example, we might would have done something like customer dot has key and then colon age. But in Elixir, we don't do that because these aren't objects. They don't have methods. We invoke a function map dot has key and the first argument will be the map. So it follows that same convention. And then the argument is in this case, colon age. It's an atom that's just a literal age or gender. These are very, very easy to use and you'll see them used all over the place, much like they are in Ruby as symbols. Blocks, if you have done Ruby, then you're probably familiar with blocks. Just like in Ruby, blocks are used a lot in Elixir, even more so actually. In fact, in Elixir, blocks are essentially used for even defining modules and functions. When we define a module, like in this example, we're defining a module called hello, we use the do. So we're, we're passing in the entire body of the module as a block to that. And this has some really awesome metaprogramming implications that we'll talk about a little bit here, but it's, uh, it's, it's very, very cool. This is one of the best Elixir features.
we define a function called world in there. That function body is also just a block that we pass in. Then there's an example on uh, line nine there of how we would invoke this new module and function that we've defined. So just like you would more or less expect, module dot function and then arguments. There is a simpler syntax for one-liners. This is something that got added to Ruby a couple years ago, fortunately, the kind of the ability to do single line definitions. But uh, in Elixir, it's, it's done a little bit differently. And this convention may seem a little odd, but once you understand how Elixir works behind the scenes with abstract syntax trees, it will make a lot more sense. But basically, instead of having the do block and then new line, we just use a comma and then we pass in do colon and then the body of the function, which if we're doing a single line should pretty much just be a single line. This is actually closer to the internal representation that these have to the compiler. So it makes more sense than it may seem currently, but uh, then it's invoked the same way module dot function. All right, pattern matching, huge, huge. To talk about pattern matching, we kind of need to start with what does equal sign really mean? When you see an equal sign, what is it really telling you? In a lot of programming, such as in Ruby, it's an assignment operator. So we're, we're essentially just saying, take whatever value is on the right that gets evaluated to, and just assign that to the left-hand side. But if you think about math and the language of mathematics where that kind of came from, that's not really what equal sign means in that context. So it's kind of it's kind of different. Elixir is a lot closer to what it means in math. Now, for the most part, you can still just use it the same way, like age equals 23. Perfectly valid in Ruby, perfectly valid in Elixir. And it does the same thing, does what you would expect. But to kind of demonstrate slightly how the equal sign differs in Elixir. Let's look at lines two and three. We would never do this in Ruby. It wouldn't make any sense. But in Elixir, it's perfectly valid. Instead of the equal sign saying assign this value, it's asking, is this equal? Basically, does this match? Is this the same? Which is a lot closer to how math does it. So on line one, we take age as a variable and a 23 as a value. Age is a variable. So the interpreter compiler can change age to match whatever it needs to, to make this statement true. So 23 on the right, however, is a literal. That cannot be changed. 23 is always gonna be the literal 23. So we make this statement true by changing the value of age to match 23. Hence the same effect as an assignment would. But line two is also perfectly valid. We can't change the value of 23 and age is already set to 23. This evaluates fine and evaluates to essentially, you know, 23 or kind of, you could think of it as true because these values are already the same. They're, they're equal, so we're good. But suppose we try to do something like line three where we say 25 equals age. Well, age is 23 and that cannot equal 25. So we get an error called a match error, essentially saying there's no way to make this, this statement work. This pattern does not match. We can take this exact approach and use it on different things to extract values, for example. So pattern matching can be used to determine, you know, kind of Boolean results, like does this pattern match, is this work? And it is used a lot, especially in like the case statement type stuff, but it can also be used to extract values. And this is something you'll use all the time. So let's look at uh, line three here, we've got our familiar ages array. And we've got that set to a li some literal values. So it's it's three long. Then look at line four. We are essentially, a, if this was Ruby, we'd say, what is that? You know, we're assigning the same array literal to the same array literal. That doesn't make any sense. In Ruby, that wouldn't be valid. But in Elixir, this is perfectly fine because the value on the left can equal the value on the right. There's no problems here. Same with line five. In this case, we're gonna use our ages variable that has been bound to that literal array at the top. And we're going to match it with an array that's A, B, and C. If you've used destructuring, especially in like JavaScript, 
then it's basically the same thing. It's very, very similar. Where we can essentially use this to say, take A, B, and C, and make them e equal to whatever they need to, to make this pattern match. And then we can see indeed, lines six, seven, and eight, the values that we wanted it to take on were taken on. Line nine, we can see another way that we can kind of change it. So because the variables are on the left side, that means that they can be changed to make the pattern match, make the pattern work. So we can change them again, and it, it does change their values. So this is a very powerful way that we can extract information or data from existing data structures, often called destructuring. Maps, we can pattern match on maps as well. So here we've got a variable we'll call customer, and we've got this map literal. And it's got a, a name key and an age key with the values. On 33, we assign it, no problems. Everything as we expect. Then on line 34, we're going to extract the name from this value. So let's say that we need the we need to operate on the name. The easiest way to do this in Elixir is to just use pattern match. So we create a map literal with a name key, and then the name on the right side of that map literal is just a variable name. So that variable will start to exist after this, and it will be set to Ben. We can also do the same thing to extract the age. So on line 35, we're gonna set variable A to age. And I, uh, I used a short variable A just as a way to make sure that it was clear that this was just some arbitrary variable name. It's not, you know, the, it doesn't have to be the same as the key or anything like that. It's just a convention that people often follow. We can see that our customer is still the same. That still has the same value. It's got the same map. But now we've got our A is set to 35 because we extracted the age and the name is extracted as well. We can also do them both at the same time. So on line 37, we've got a map literal that has a name key and an age key, and those get set to variables that are destructured from the customer object or the customer variable. I feel like I'm saying the word variable a lot. As you can see, lines 38 and 39, it does what we'd expect it to do. So this can be very powerful. And you will see this used actually to invoke methods a lot, which is really, really neat. It's kind of a way of uh, almost think of method overloading, where you've got these patterns in the list of arguments and you can invoke different functions depending on whether the pattern matches or not. It's, it's, very, it's very great. And that's, that's how you can get rid of a ton of if statements that would normally exist in Ruby and in Elixir, they don't exist. It just, it calls the right version of the function and you can get fairly specific about what input data your function operates on, which is also self-documenting, which is nice. So as I kind of mentioned earlier, pattern matching isn't only used for the equals operator. Functions can be invoked based on this pattern matching. In this pattern matching with functions, we specify the pattern that needs to match in the arguments to the function definition. And Elixir will essentially go through each of the functions of the correct name, and it will find one, it will go through them in order and say, does this pattern match? Does this pattern match? And it will keep going until it either finds a match or runs out of possibilities. If it runs out of possibilities, it will throw an exception so that you will see an error or, and you can either handle that error or let it go or whatever you want to do. Let's look at some fairly idiomatic Elixir code here that demonstrates pattern matching. So we've got the classic computer science problem, factorial. We're trying to write a function or module that calculates factorial of some value n. We're going to create a module, factorial, and we've got a function called of. You may notice of looks to be defined twice. And the first definition looks a little nonsensical if you're used to Ruby. The argument there is a literal zero. If you think about how that behaves in that pattern matching that we looked at a couple slides ago, this is what you want. It will match the literal value zero. And in that case, it will just execute the body, which in this case is just return the value one. If it doesn't match, then the second definition of the function that takes in a variable n will match. And so n gets set to the argument and then we can execute you know, n times and then we recursively invoke ourselves with n minus one. 
So if you've done the recursive solution to factorial before, this should look extremely familiar. The only difference here is we're not using an if statement. The way that we invoke this is displayed down below here. So lines eight through 10, we can see kind of how do we do a loop. So enum.each, and then we use a range. So we iterate through this and we can print out factorial of, and you can see the output of this on the right in the screenshot. To help illustrate how this pattern matching works with our factorial module, let's intentionally inject a bug and let's see how it impacts our code. So we're gonna flip the order around. So lines four and five will, are now swapped. So instead of the dot of that takes in the zero literal being on top where it will match first, it's on the bottom. So if you think about how this is supposed to work, the pattern matching goes through each function of, this, of the name and looks for the first one where the pattern matches. Well, n, the variable, will always match anything. So whatever the argument is, will always match. Fortunately, and this is a really nice thing about the Elixir compiler, it will actually warn us and tell us that, hey, uh, line four is always gonna match. So you've probably got a bug. And it's also very nice, easy to understand error message, so. Let's talk about guard clauses. Guard clauses are another option, another way that we can do this factorial. We can actually use guard clauses to fix the bug in our code that resulted from changing the order around. For the guard clause, we essentially added that when keyword. So we say when is integer, which is just a utility function that make sure that the input argument is an integer. And when that argument is greater than zero, then we're gonna execute the body of the function. So that's the only change we've made and it fixed the bug in our code. And the reason this works now is that the first function does not always match every single argument that comes in. If the argument is zero when it comes in, it will evaluate it and say dot of, okay, we'll look at that and it'll say is n an integer? Yes, it is. Zero is an integer. Is it greater than zero? No, it is not. So that no longer passes. So then we fall to the second function and we say, does that match? Does a literal zero match a zero? Yes, it does. So we execute the function body, which is just the literal one. The code works great. At the bottom here, I rewrote the previous version of our factorial loop to just demonstrate different ways to write the same thing. Don't worry about this pipe syntax right now. You will understand this in a moment. Just know that the pipe and then the greater than sign there is just the pipe operator in Elixir. We take the range literal 1.6 and we're gonna run that through enum.map. Uh, it runs through our little pipeline here and we get the output on the right. Again, I'm gonna explain this in just a second, so don't worry about that. I promised I would. The pipe operator, in my opinion, is one of Elixir's best features. This lets us build transformation chains in a much more palatable way, in my opinion, than what they would be without the pipe operator. In fact, if the, pot, the pipe operator didn't exist, I don't think I'd like Elixir that much because it would just be very onerous. You'll see what I mean here in a minute. With the pipe operator, we can chain function calls together. So if you're familiar with Ruby, then you've, you've probably used some list dot sort dot reverse dot whatever. And you can chain these calls together using the dot operator. And that works because the functions that you're invoking or the methods you're invoking will return the, the same object back so that you can dereference it. And that's often called a fluent API. It's very, very nice. Well, in Elixir, we're not dealing with methods. Remember, we are not operating on objects. So we can't invoke dot something, dot something, dot something in Elixir. So that breaks one of the best, most elegant ways to express things. And that is where the pipe operator flies to the rescue. The pipe operator will often feel like the, that familiar and convenient object-oriented approach where you're you know, dot chaining, but it still works in a functional way. So it is the best of both worlds. Really all the pipe operator does is syntactic sugar for passing the previous value 
So whatever is on the left side of that pipe, it passes that in as the first argument to the next function. That's it. That's all it does. So it's, it's very simple. Some examples will, uh, I think, help a lot to make, make more sense. So let's take a look at our factorial code. So we're back to the original working uh, factorial module that we started with, but we're now tweaking and changing the loop at the bottom where we loop through. Okay, so we're back to our original factorial module that solved our factorial for us, but I've changed the loop at the bottom. I've rewritten this loop in a very explicit functional way. Aside from the fact that it's all on one line, there's a lot of nested function calls here, and it's really difficult to read. You can kind of get an idea that, oh, it's printing something out, that, thanks to the io.puts. But then you have to look at enum.join, enum.map, enum.map. And in order to figure out and reason about what this code is doing and where all these values are coming from, you have to kind of work from the inside out, which is not a very pleasant way to read it. It's, uh, in fact, I would go as far as to say it's just quite gross. So let's, uh, let's try to format it better. We did break the classic programming rule of having one continuous run on line that is way more than our 80 character ideal and 120 limit that most people use. So let's just format it better because there are some things we could do to improve this without changing any syntax by just adding some white space. Yeah, that's that's a little bit better. It's it's certainly more readable than it was. It's still a little gross though, in my opinion. We still have to read from the inside out. It's difficult to quickly reason about what this is doing. If you are trying to understand the algorithm here, you've got some reading to do and some thinking, particularly in that enum.join. You know, it's got that second argument that's several lines down. It's difficult to really see exactly what's going on. So this is better, but it's still a little bit gross. So we do still need our pipe operator. Let's take a look at how this looks when it's rewritten with our friend, the beloved pipe operator. Line eight, you can see we're actually starting with our transformation chain with a range literal, so 1.6. That value gets evaluated and passed via the pipe operator into enum.map as its first argument. And then the second argument to enum.map is the one you see on line nine, which is a function, just a, a function defined in place like that, which is like a Lambda function. The, there's a little bit of Elixir syntax here, but hopefully it's fairly readable to you. The FN is the keyword that basically says, we're declaring an inline function here, or a Lambda function, however you want to think about it. It takes a single argument, at, again, still on line nine here, it takes a single argument that we'll call i, and then the function body here is, uh, it's going to return a tuple. So I mentioned earlier tuples and how they're often used as return values. This is a good example of that. We're, all we're doing with this map is essentially we're taking this single i and we're transforming it into a tuple that has the original i value and then comma and then the factorial of i. So you can see an example on line 10 of how this would look and how we would destructure it. So we take that output value and in good functional form, we are passing in all of the data. We're not doing any side effects or changing anything. In our second enum.map there on line 10, we're taking the output from that first enum.map, which is going to be a list of tuples where the first value in the tuple is the i value, and then the second one is the factorial of that i value. Then on our second enum.map call on line 10 here, we are taking the output from the previous map function and we are running it through this other function. This function takes a single argument, which is a tuple, and that tuple has two items in it, the i and the factorial of i that was calculated earlier. That will get mapped to a string that is interpolated, giving us the output on the right with the factorial. So we're gonna return a string from the enum.map on line 10. Now you may be thinking, why didn't we just do both of those things, calculate the factorial and write the string in the first enum.map? We totally could have, but 
it's a lot easier to understand this way when we break it down into the, the steps of the transformation. If we had it just a single step that transformed it into a string, it wouldn't be nearly as clear. By seeing it this way, it's also immediately clear where the actual computation is happening. So if we need to do some optimizing to improve the runtime of this factorial function, we know exactly where to look. It's very easy to see. Then the return value comes back. So now we have a list of strings or an array of strings, if you want to think about it that way. And we want to ultimately print this list out. So what is there to do? What's the best thing? Well, uh, let's, let's join them. So we can use the enum.join function, which expects you to be operating on an enum that consists of strings. In this case, it is, it's a list of strings. So it will do the join and it will join them with a backslash n. So we get a line break in there and the return value from that will be a single string. So after line 11 returns a single string, line 12 takes that and makes that the first argument to io.puts and it prints out our string. So there's a couple of things that you may notice right off the bat here. This program is not going to print its results until it is done. That's an important performance consideration to keep in mind as you are developing and designing. If you are familiar with the Ruby ecosystem, you may be wondering what are some of the equivalents in Elixir land? We've already kind of mentioned IRB and IEX. IEX is the equivalent of IRB, stands for Interactive Elixir, just like IRB stands for Interactive Ruby, and it behaves like you would expect. So when thinking about uh, gems, Ruby gems comes to mind as kind of the place where the packages live. Hex is the equivalent in Elixir. So Hex is where the packages live. Bundler in Ruby, if you don't use Bundler, you're missing out and I don't know where you've been, but Bundler is used to manage a whole bunch of different dependencies uh, with different versions. In Elixir land, that's what Mix does for us. Mix also covers the territory of Rake. So Rake, in my opinion, way underrated tool. I love it. I use it for all kinds of things. I still write Rake files even for don't tell anybody I said this, but even for like Golang projects, like I've, I've got a tool that's, it's a Golang command line tool and uh, the build system is a rake file. So it uses Ruby. Uh, that doesn't bother me at all. I love that. Like I said earlier, I use Ruby for a lot of my scripting stuff because it's just such a wonderful scripting language, but uh, some people get get grossed out by, by Ruby in a Go project who want to uh, use a traditional make file. But anyway, so uh, Mix takes the job of rake in Elixir. So you can write little mix tasks and you'll notice when you're working with fr frameworks like Phoenix, you'll see there's mix tasks that will generate things for you. So it will become fairly clear pretty quick. Okay, we've mentioned Phoenix a ton. So let's go into what Phoenix actually is. Well, the simplest answer to that is it's the rails of Elixir land. So uh, Phoenix is basically a web framework that will look and feel a ton like Rails, if you're familiar with that. But it has some really nice differences that I think are genuine improvements. When I first put this presentation together, it was several years ago, Phoenix 1.4 was the latest and now 1.7 was just barely released like a couple days ago. And I actually haven't looked at it yet, I need to, but. So I did, I created an example project and this project is where the code examples that we're gonna look in the next few slides come from. At this point, this app is probably kind of outdated. It, it's not gonna have changed a ton, but uh, it will have changed a little bit and I, I haven't kept it up to date, but you're totally welcome to look at it and you know use it all you want. But um, there, are probably, uh, there are probably some better examples out there. I'll link some in the description. Before we get deeply into it, we all know and acknowledge how flawed framework benchmarks and language benchmarks can be. So let's keep that in mind and take this with a heavy grain of salt, especially since these results are from a long time, like several years. They were already old a few years ago when I first put them in there. So uh, the responsible thing to do would probably just rip this slide out, but I'm gonna leave it in here for, for historical reasons.
but uh, you can you can see some of the results of, of benchmarks. Phoenix is a lot faster than Rails was at the time. And it's also compared to a number of other frameworks. So you can actually kind of see Phoenix actually outperforms Jin from Golang land, Play from Java land, Express from Node.js land, and Martini from Goland and Sinatra, which is one of my favorite frameworks that I, I still use. It's so much faster. The amount of overhead that it introduces is very minimal. Now, these numbers will have surely changed, especially the Rails numbers. I know in the past few years, Ruby and Rails have gotten a lot of performance love, so the gap may not be nearly as wide now. So keep that in mind. If you're, if you're considering this for purely performance reasons, know that Phoenix is blazing fast. I often get sub millisecond response times. And that is absolutely not the norm in any other framework that I've used. But uh, it, it may not be the fastest and it, it probably isn't the fastest at a heavily CPU bound type stuff, but your mileage may vary. So I've mentioned that Phoenix is very scalable. Let's talk a little bit more in depth here about why. Why is Phoenix so scalable? Well, uh, being built on top of the Erlang VM, Phoenix has full access to the actor model. Phoenix makes great use of this to optimize things and get things done, especially when it comes to channels, which are basically web sockets and live view, which is built on top of channels. The amount of performance and tuning that the Erlang VM has received over the years, the Beam originally had to run on very, very primitive by today's standards hardware. So it is very, very highly optimized. And it has so, I mean, the overhead to a computer nowadays is so, so little that it doesn't even seem worth mentioning. I mean, it's, it's just, it's so non-existent. All those decades of optimization work and investment directly benefit Phoenix. So that's, that's part of why Phoenix is so scalable. I mentioned with the actor model that it parallelizes across processes and across nodes on different machines in the same cluster, you can take advantage of that with your application architecture, but you also don't have to. If it makes your deployment story a lot simpler to just treat this Phoenix app like you would a Rails app that's you know, just lighter and faster than Rails, but otherwise each have these own very separate instances that don't necessarily even know about each other, you can totally do that. And it's, it works, it's, it's totally fine. And you still get a lot of performance benefits. But the key to horizontal scaling, as I mentioned earlier, is multi-process. You're not going to be able to scale real high with multi-threads. Elixir and Erlang make that multi-process very easy to do, even for noobs. It's very noob friendly. Uh, the other thing that makes Phoenix so scalable is it fits very neatly into many different architectures. If you have a microservice architecture and you've got a bunch of different little services out there, some that are just APIs, some that might have UI on them, Phoenix is gonna work great for that. If you wanna have one giant monolithic application, Phoenix can work great for that too. So uh, it's, uh, it's, very, it's very nice that way. I've mentioned a couple times Live View. I, I do wanna point out Live View is not Phoenix and Phoenix is not Live View. There's a lot of confusion around the internet that I've run into where people are kind of assuming that Phoenix is the same thing as LiveView. It is not. Phoenix is a, lot, is a framework much like Rails. It has traditional views in it. Nowadays, we kind of call them dead views. But Phoenix also has this LiveView option. And the LiveView is what essentially could potentially replace your JavaScript framework on the front end. It allows you to do server-side rendering for basically anything, anything that you want. So you don't even need JavaScript if you don't want it. As I mentioned earlier, I still use some client-side JavaScript because I think that's a much better user experience. I'll usually throw Alpine into my apps, but uh, it is, is possible not to. So you can see this is a GIF of essentially server-side rendered clock. So th this GIF is actually really low performance. <laughs> the real clock performs like flawlessly. You don't even, you don't even really see it ticking, it's so quick because it, uh, it can do more than 60 frames per second, so. Some of the major components in Phoenix, if you're going to investigate Phoenix as a Ruby and or Rails person, I wanna just cover a couple of the high level concepts so that you 
we'll be more prepared for that. Some of the major components in Phoenix, which all, all, much of these will probably sound familiar. You've got the router, handles incoming requests, controllers, views, templates, channels, and Ecto. I hate to call it an ORM because I don't really consider it an ORM. It's kind of, it fills sort of the same role as active record. In my opinion, it is, it's great. I, I love Ecto. It is, I tend to be very critical of ORMs, generally speaking. In many applications, I end up writing a lot of my own SQL directly, not in Phoenix projects. I have yet to find a case where Ecto wasn't great. So uh, they surely exist, but for the most part, I've been very happy with Ecto. It's, it's a language that, it's a DSL that's very similar to SQL and often directly translatable. We'll look at a couple examples. The router in Phoenix is built like a pipeline. So if you think back to earlier in this presentation, we talked about thinking about data transformation and how data changes and thinking in forms of pipelines with pipe operator and whatnot. Phoenix does exactly that. We'll look at a, an example here in a slide, but underlying the Phoenix router is a library called plug, which is really neat. Uh, you can think of plug almost like Sinatra. It's really cool. The plug library is, is great, but uh, it's, it's used underneath, so it's very pipeable. And the router in Phoenix is very declarative like Rails is, which is fantastic in my opinion. Here is an example of a router in Phoenix. So this is just comes from that example application that I mentioned. And there are many different ways to do this, but I tried to write an example that kind of showed different things as much as possible. But this is the entire router. So you can see it's it's not real verbose. It uh, you know defines a handful of pages and API endpoints, and that's it. So it's very declarative. The, uh, the big thing that you may not understand as a Rails person were, would be these pipelines here. We've got two pipelines we define in here, one called browser, one called API. This is basically just, think of it, this is basically just where we define the middleware. So when we have requests comes in from a browser, there are a handful of headers and things we need to set. And those are all very standard. So there's no, there's no need for our application to do any of that. It has nothing to do with our business logic for the most part. So we can just use these built-in plugs and Phoenix will generate this for you. So you don't even have to, you don't have to look these up or anything, but it'll add cross-site request forgery protection and secure browser headers and all the good stuff. But for API requests that are coming in that are just JSON, we don't need all that browser stuff. We're not setting cookies or headers or any of that stuff. So all we need to really do is just add a header that says we accept JSON and you know we're gonna return date JSON and stuff. So we've got those two different pipelines and then our routes below basically just send the request through whichever pipeline it should be. So for the, the browser one, like the, uh, the get of slash on the, goes to a page controller at uh, a function called index. And then we've got a couple of, we've got a few resources. So these resources are much like they are in Rails. We're essentially gonna use sort of the REST API normal semantics to define a handful of functions that will operate kind of on these, these objects, uh, users, sessions, and build proxies. I'm using the uh, only keyword argument on users and sessions to specify only make these certain actions. So in the case of users, index, show, new, create, edit, and update. With sessions, the only ones that are really valid, the only ones we want to generate are new, create, and delete. With the build proxies, we generate all of them. So no big deal there. Then for the API below, you can see we're getting more specific. So we use the post keyword, which basically is just going to only create a post endpoint. There's no valid gets or anything for these, these objects, for these for the uh, build proxies here. These are basically meant to be called, for this particular application, this was just a very simple Slack poster type thing that more or less what we wanted to be able to do is drop a curl command into our CI CD scripts. And this is a horribly over-engineered solution to that problem. I, I needed something to use as an example. And uh, we won't get into specifics, but there were a couple of reasons why we needed more functionality than, because you can, you can curl the Slack API right from CI script, but 
we, we needed more granularity there. And we also didn't want to leak our Slack token. We wanted that to stay secret. And we wanted to put some access controls around it. So that's what little application here. But anyway, don't judge. Uh, so this is a uh, fairly straightforward, fairly, fairly predictable router. Much like Rails can generate a list of routes, so can Phoenix. We'll see here, we've got mix phx.routes and it will print out basically all of the valid routes. On the, the middle section there where you see like slash, slash users, that is showing you the path. So that would be what your browser path would be. And then on the right, it's showing the module and the function and the action that are being called for that particular path. And you can also see the, the verbs and stuff. On the very left side, these uh, where it says like session path, build proxy path, those are function names. Don't worry about those right now, but those will be used for, for getting routes basically from the, from the router. Controllers. So controllers are part of the request pipeline. The controllers get invoked by the router. These do what you largely expect them to do from Rails land. They're gonna take in a connection object called con, and this is the state. So if you think about how functional programming and Elixir encourages treating state, we don't want it, we want it to be kind of minimized and contained as much as possible, but there is some state that we have to have as we process these web requests. So con is our connection object, and that is where that state is going to live. So it's gonna get passed all over the place. And when we need to make some sort of change to the state, we will more or less add it to this con object, and then we return the con. So all the functions can work together by examining essentially the same data structure and making whatever changes they need to it. And again, this is all immutable. So you're not changing or mutating the input con that will stay the same. You're making a copy and then returning that. And the future functions will be operating on the copy that you returned. And that will all be done explicitly because they will be piped in that order. The controller is often just going to make some sort of a database query or you know, perform some sort of logic. And it'll usually invoke some view. And uh, view, you can think of basically there's views and templates that are slightly different in Phoenix, but it, the view's job is more or less to return some value. In the case of a JSON API, the view may just return a map, which gets JSONified automatically. In the case of a browser-based page, the view may just invoke some template and render that template. So sometimes the views are very, very lightweight, and sometimes they contain the bulk of the logic, but the controller's job is mainly any sort of database interaction should happen in the controller. The view is only gonna do, it's just a good functional programming type view. It's only gonna take the data that it gets passed in and then render some text output, more or less. So any sort of data changes, database queries, those should happen in the controller. Here is an example controller. This uh, just has an index function on it. So this is for the uh, page controller. So the, the job of this particular function is to just render the index page when the user browses to the root. So you can see it uses the con object. It checks to see if there's a current user assigned in that con. And if there is, then it's gonna redirect you to the build proxy index. So you can see the list of build proxies. Otherwise, it's just gonna render index.html which will encourage you to log in. Here's the session controller. So this one is a little bit more complex. The purpose of this session controller is to handle these login sessions. You can see the, the new function on line, starts on line four. All that does is just, just gonna render new.html. There's no database calls or anything that need to be done in that case. We just need to render HTML. So it's very simple. On the create call, we do need to make some database changes. So you can see with create, we're going to, uh, this a session creation, by the way, is a log in. It's, it's the user trying to log in. So we're gonna take the user's email and password. We will extract those from the parameters that are passed in. We will check to see, is this a valid email and password? And if it is, then we'll throw a flash in there that says, welcome back user. 
and we'll redirect to the index page. If the password is wrong or you know authentication fails for some reason, then we'll put a flash error basically saying invalid email password combination and we'll just render new.html again. The delete is just going to log out. So deleting a session is essentially logging out. You can see that the code that actually does a lot of this stuff, the login and the logout code are not directly in the controller. That's a modular design where we separate those into a context where they can be invoked either from different places or by tests or, or anything. That way we, we kind of modularize and, and separate it. So the controller is focused on handling a web request, but the actual application may be doing many other things. Who knows, we might need a command line client or something and we can reuse the context module because it's, it's not really a, a web thing. Here's the user controller. I won't go through all of this, but there's a couple that uh, I'll point out. We, I mentioned plugs. You can see here, there's a couple of plugs. So we've got one that's authenticate user. So if the action is index or show, then we wanna execute that authenticate user plug. And that will make sure that the user is authenticated. And for these other ones, there's a couple of actions that we only want admins to be able to do. So in this, in this app, there are normal users and there are admin users. And a couple of these are only appropriate for admins. So that is where the access control takes place. Other than that, you can see it uh, largely does what you'd expect it to do. Let's look uh, as an example on line 10, the index. It's gonna just get a list of all the users from the database. And it's just gonna render index.html with those users as passed in data. And the view, and more specifically in this case, the template, is gonna take that list of users that comes in and it's gonna render those into HTML. So it'll look nice and pretty. Views. So views are modules that contain rendering functions that will convert the data into a format the end user will consume. As I mentioned before, sometimes this is HTML, sometimes this is JSON. The view modules are what are going to render something, whether it's JSON or HTML or whatever it is, the view's job is to return that. In the case of a lot of, of UI, the view will just more or less return some template. So a template is basically like an EEX embedded Elixir, which is same as ERB. It's got maybe a sprinkle of Elixir code in there that takes the data and transforms it into HTML. But the rest of it is just more or less HTML code and that gets rendered. Templates. So these are uh, web pages or fragments that allow static markup and native code. So this is uh, EEX, this is Elixir's version of ERB. It is very, very fast in Phoenix, which is awesome. In fact, I did some testing because these templates are pre-compiled. So they're essentially pre-compiled static strings. And I did some testing and uh, in some cases, this outperformed Nginx when, uh, when Nginx had to read the file from the, from the disk, it was, it was a lot faster for, uh, for Phoenix. So generally speaking, this is, this is very, very fast and very performant. Internally, they are linked lists that get concatenated, eliminating the string copying steps over a huge bottleneck that other frameworks have. For templates, there are a number of helper functions that are available, just like there is in ERB. And these templates can also be nested. So you can have little partials and little snippets and inject them where you want them to go. So it's, it's very, uh, very useful. These templates are so easy and fast to work with that I've actually started using this instead of static site generation in some cases, not in all cases, but I, I'm a big fan of Next.js, but this is really easy and pleasant to use. Here is an example template. We can see here it's mostly just HTML. We're going to render a handful of pieces of data into HTML. This looks so much like Rails that you may not even know whether it is or not. There's this syntax like at user that can reference variables. And internally, these are a data structure that's under a keyword called assigns, but there's a little bit of magic here to make that work. You don't have to use the magic version. You can actually use the explicit version if you prefer, which is what I usually do. But the at approach is so familiar to Rails users. 
So I, uh, I wanted to show that. Channels. Channels are really neat in Phoenix. Channels are basically the web socket. So with the channel, you can have stateful conversations. And this also applies to live view. Channels are implemented with either web sockets, but it also supports long polling, or you can even add your own protocol if you have unique needs. When you're dealing with a channel, the nice thing about this is that unlike with a typical web cycle where you've got single requests and then termination of the connection and no more and the state disappears the only thing that the server will will often get is just what comes back from the client on the next request and that model has a lot of benefits and, and works nice but in applications where you need a stateful conversation this can be really really fantastic again live view is built on top of this so you can get amazing performance out of it and the way that this works is by essentially there's uh, some JavaScript that is implemented in phoenix.js and that implements the JavaScript necessary to hook the channels and in the case of live view to hook live view up and that way you don't have to write JavaScript. Ecto, I mentioned that I have a lot of love for Ecto. Again, I hate calling it an ORM, but you can think of it as an ORM for Elixir. It uses the Elixir macro system, which is a whole, there's a, there's a couple videos on that that uh, love to make, but it's, it's really neat. If, if you, especially if you enjoy metaprogramming in Ruby, it is like metaprogramming. It's awesome. It's basically, you'll hit this point where you realize that Elixir is basically a lisp. It's like a mix of a Ruby and a lisp language. It's got the syntax and joy of Ruby, but the ability to directly and easily manipulate the abstract syntax tree or AST at compile time is, is built in. And Ecto uses a lot of these macros to give us a very powerful DSL or domain specific language, which looks very, very similar. It is syntactically valid Elixir code, but it looks and reads so much like SQL that you may not even need to look at the Ecto docs to be able to read some of the Ecto queries. They're very, very straightforward. And we'll look at some. Um, there, This is probably the biggest area where Phoenix differs from Rails, in my opinion. It's a good differ, but it is, it is very different. One thing about Ecto that I love is it only returns data that you explicitly request. I have had to solve so many performance issues with Rails code where we were requesting data we just didn't need. And Active Record makes that so easy to do. But in Ecto, you have to explicitly, explicitly request it. So what I find is that both myself and others that I work with spend a lot more effort figuring out what they actually need. And that leads to much better performance, much more understandable code, and all around wins. Here's an example of a migration from Ecto. As you would imagine, Ecto has a system for migrations, which any good framework will and should. It is very readable, very declarative style. So you can see an example, here's a def change. If you're familiar with Rails, this probably seems familiar, if you're familiar with Active Record. But it's, it's pretty straightforward and easy to understand what's happening here. We're creating a table, and that table is called users. We're gonna add three columns name, username is admin. And then timestamps is a special sort of utility that will automatically add a couple of timestamp columns, just like Rails does, or I should say active record. And then we create a unique index for the users table on the column username. Here are some examples of Ecto schemas. You can see that it is very readable and very straightforward. So we're defining the schema for users. So this is the users table on the left here. We've got those three columns that we saw earlier that we created name, username is admin. We're using that uh, kind of special has one credential, which is a very uh, Rails-like thing. And that will do a little bit of magic that makes it very easy for us to sort of chain these things together and, uh, and request data that's related. You can see on the right side is the credentials. So this is what is specified as a has one. That has an email, a password, and a password hash filled. 
And you can see we also have the belongs to user in there, so we can kind of go both directions. But those are totally optional. It's sometimes you want them, sometimes you won't. It's just up to how you plan to use them, and often it just really depends on what the data model is. Here are some example Ecto queries. Uh, as an example of how similar it can be to SQL, let's look at line 186 here, get user by email. So in this case, we have an email address just coming in as a string, and we want to find the user object that is associated with it. I put this example in here because it requires a table join. In some ORMs, this is where things can get abstract and kind of weird, but you can see how closely it kind of follows SQL here. You know, it's, it's not exactly the same, but it follows fairly close. We've got this from macro, which is a big one, u in user. So we're essentially saying u is going to be the variable that is represented by our user. And th this is very similar to kind of an as keyword. We're going to say join and, you know, for C in association of the credential. So basically in the associated credential related to this user where we're joining, uh, we're going to join this where the c.email, so the credential email, is the same as the email address that gets passed in. So if you think about what's happening here, we want the user whose email is associated, but that user does not have an email field, an email column in them directly. That is a separate table, a credentials table. And the credentials table is where the email is. So we need to, we're basically jumping here, whereas with a credential, we could just look it up directly by the column value. We want, we need to do a join here to get the user who is associated with that credential object. Then we pipe it into repo.1, which is basically Ecto's way of saying we expect one and only one result. If we get multiple results, we'll throw an exception or uh, you know some sort of error handling. And then we can also use repo.preload to preload the credential. So this is important for avoiding the n plus one problem. Okay, we have nearly made it through here. I think my camera was doing some really horrible things earlier. I, I hope not, uh, but anyway, the uh, deployment scenario. So what is it like to deploy an Elixir Phoenix app? The deployment scenario is really pretty similar to Rails and it's, it's even better now than it was when I first made this. There are platforms as a service that you can use that support Phoenix. Uh, you know, Heroku, there's one called Gig Elixir, which is, is very similar. I haven't looked at those in a while and uh, Heroku has been getting some really bad press. The, uh, as I record this now, it's March of 2023. And there's been some, there's been some real bad news from, from Heroku, different security problems, different outages and stuff. So mm. it's too bad. I, uh, I don't use Heroku anymore, but they, uh, they have a special place in my heart and they're the parents of the 12 factor app methodology, which I'm also a big fan of. And by the way, if you don't know what that 12 factor app methodology is, you should, you should definitely find out. And I, I think I have a video on that actually. I'll, I'll link, I'll link it. But um, deployment scenario is pretty good. You can, there are different options, you know, besides just the platform as a service option, you can deploy it much like you would a Rails app by just running the Cowboy HTTP server. There's a new one called Bandit that I think, I haven't looked at the 1.7 Phoenix came out just a few days ago and I haven't looked at that yet. But uh, I think it, it may have support for Bandit. But anyway, there you can run it like a Rails app and that's really awesome depending on your situation because you can run, like you can get an IEX prompt that's hooked up to production, which is both glorious and scary at the same time. Kind of depends on your app, what it does, who you're serving, what your production environment is like, but uh, you can do that. You can also compile it down to Erlang Beam code where there's no Elixir at all. And um, that's probably the most common nowadays. It's very easy to throw this in a Docker file. In fact, the new Phoenix, I believe, comes with a Docker file built in to the generator. So you don't even have to sling Docker, but if you do want to sling Docker, I'm a big fan of Docker. I've got a, some videos on that as well. I'll link those as well too. But um, it's it's very, very easy to just deploy this sucker to Kubernetes or you know any sort of Docker container runner. So pretty uh, pretty good. You can also go all out with Erlang VM cluster. So you can go old school and have like pet servers. Uh, I say pet as in like the difference between pet and cattle. 
So servers that are long lived and we give them names, that sort of thing. You can build a traditional Erlang VM cluster out of that, which uh, is perfectly fine. You can also use, there's some tools now where you can have an automatic cluster that's just basically set up by, you run it in Kubernetes like you would a normal application, but each instance will auto discover the other instances and form a cluster. So there's lots of options for deployment and uh, deployment nowadays for Phoenix app is, is pretty good. So not something to worry about if, if that's a area of concern that you've had. The ultimate question, will Elixir replace Ruby? No, I don't, I don't think so. Um, at the time when this slide was, was there, Ruby had started to get a little long in the tooth. The, there wasn't really anything exciting coming out of the Ruby camp. Rails was fairly stagnant. I mean, I wouldn't say stagnant, but static. Things weren't changing much, which is, is good in a lot of ways, especially doing web development. It's really, I've, I often feel fatigue and burnout from the rapid pace of change. So it, it's not necessarily a bad thing to be stable. In fact, it's kind of nice in some cases, but uh, Ruby has since, uh, I think Ruby 2.6 was the, the latest Ruby at that time. And 2.7 came out, but Ruby 3 brought a lot of cool stuff. So it, it's some of the features will sound like Elixir features, like pattern matching and pipeline, but they're not quite the same thing. They, they're, they're a little bit different, but uh, Ruby, is, Ruby is still going and Ruby is still strong. And at the point in time when I first did this, there weren't many new Rails apps being created. Most of the Rails apps were legacy type stuff. Nowadays, I still don't really know of any Rails apps being created, but it's certainly a lot more plausible than it than it was. So Ruby is coming back. Ruby is Ruby's got a great future, and um, even if Rails were to start fading from the popular culture, Ruby the language I think will always have a place. Uh, I love it, and as I mentioned before, in my opinion, it is the best scripting language, and it's so great for prototyping and things. So. No, I don't think Elixir will ever replace Ruby. I think it's just another great option to have. It's just another tool in the tool belt. So I use Elixir and Phoenix for new applications, but I, but I also still use Ruby. So I suspect that there's a lot of people out there that will continue to just use Ruby. They, that's what they know and love, and that's, that's great. I'm glad to see Ruby survive anything but Python. Okay, I shouldn't have slipped that in there. All right. So quick conclusions here. Uh, if you like Ruby and Rails, then Elixir and Phoenix may have a place for you. I think it's, it's worth checking out. I don't think Elixir is gonna replace all of Ruby, but it could definitely be a valuable part of your stack. It is to me. And something that you definitely need to know, there's a lot more to Elixir than what we've gone today. I tried to, I tried to keep the, the information flowing, use the time wisely, and useful for people who know Ruby, but there is a lot more to Elixir. If you were thrown into an Elixir project without any help or warning, I think you could probably swim at this point. You'd, you'd probably be able to catch on. You're not gonna drown, but uh, there's definitely still some to learn. Some advice for further study. Phoenix contexts are an interesting area that we didn't really get into with, in this talk. Uh, this is based on Ma Martin Fowler's bounded context. It's um, it's it's really neat, really neat approach, and something that that I like. It doesn't always feel perfect, but overall, I think it is uh, I think it is nice. Ecto, we only dipped a toe into Ecto. Ecto is uh, there's so much more there. In fact, I if if there's interest, I may even just do a video on Ecto because it's uh, it's so great. Also, for further study, uh, check out more about Erlang's actor model implementation. There's a number of cool videos floating around. I'll try to link one that I, I think is particularly great, but um, it's a it's really interesting model. And for the most part, when you're writing Elixir code, you don't really have to think about the actor model, but it's there when you need it. And it can be very useful. It's, it's mainly something that a library writer would use. So if you wanna start writing your own libraries, then uh, that's where actor model's gonna start being something that you interact with. But it's mainly one of those things that 
you benefit from but don't have to really know. But it is really cool and it's, it's really useful to understand how it works. Channels, you definitely want to look into channels more and live view. Obviously we, we have such, we didn't even really look at a live view example, but uh, live view is, is really hot and really cool. So it's definitely worth looking into more. OTP, OTP is a, an Erlang thing. It's what Phoenix is kind of built on top of and the actor model. If you wanna get serious about Elixir, then you'll have to learn some OTP at some point, but it, it's more of an implementation detail if you're not going to get serious with uh, with Elixir, then it's probably not worth it. But this is my recommendations for how to further your studies. These are a couple of awesome resources. I really enjoyed both of these books. They're a little bit outdated now. Uh, the Program of Phoenix 1.4, this is the latest one. But as I mentioned, 1.7 just came out a few days ago. So that book should still be pretty accurate. I would expect most or all of the code would, will still work fine, but there will be some small differences. So it'd be awesome to get a new edition out for uh, Programming Phoenix, but uh, Programming Elixir, still great. Um, you know, very much up to date. I would totally recommend both of these books today. If you really want to get more into this, these are the two to get. There are a handful of other books. You know, there's some that's like Programming Ecto. There's one Programming Live View. Those are also really good books. So definitely something to consider, but, uh, but these are the two I would start with. Some more places you can go. Uh, the Elixir forums are really, really great. It's a very helpful community. They're for the most part, pretty nice to noobs. And there's a lot of great content on there. A lot of great answers and stuff. Elixir cones is a super fun project. Even if you don't want to learn that much more about Elixir, you might even still check out Elixir cones because they're they're like a series of exercises that you can kind of go through in Elixir and they're fun. It's it's cool. The there is an Elixir Slack team that you can join if you would like. There's a there's a link right there. And uh, I'll add a link to the description as well on YouTube. The Urug Slack team Elixir channel uh, I originally gave this talk in Utah. So this was, uh, that's the Utah Ruby users group. So there was, there was more reason to put that slide on there, but if you're not in Utah, you probably don't care about that. You rug. So, uh, Phoenix, more resources there. The hex docs, hex docs are another great Elixir thing that we didn't even talk about. The documentation is a first class citizen in Elixir, and you can actually write documentation right in comments, right above your functions and modules, and they will automatically be compiled into beautiful HTML docs. And if you push your package to hex docs, it automatically gets created into an, an online site where people can read the documentation. So it's, it's really neat. And a lot of the developer tools will read these docs. Documentation in Elixir is a big deal. There's a real focus on that. So the hex docs, are really good for a lot of modules. So I would definitely check there first. And Phoenix in particular, the hex docs are, are just really phenomenal. Then there's a medium, medium link there. I haven't read that recently, but uh, I put it there for a reason, obviously. So it must be good. Uh, here's a couple of, uh, couple of references there. I, uh, I don't really do anything on Twitter and I haven't been checking this Proton Mail in a while. So if you want to contact me, probably YouTube comment is probably the best way. But um, anyway, thank you for watching. I hope this was a helpful video. And if nothing else, hopefully you feel like you could survive in the jungle alone if you were dropped into an Elixir project.